Perfect. Here we go. All right. Um, this is uh, this recording is live. Dennis, we're like co-leading this session. I How do we so. want to do this? Um, I can share my screen. There isn't really a whole lot to share the screen for, but I will share my screen right now. I put a link to the agenda in the live chat. Cool. Is this big enough? Yeah, it looks good to me, Dennis. And if I can read it, anybody should be able to. Cool. Um, all right. So during this uh, session, we're going to talk about um, the importance of having a UI for Pulp. Pulp has never had a UI, and uh, we have probably uh, had less of an adoption of Pulp because of its lack of a UI. Um, and right now, we don't have a CLI either. And I know that we're working on one. Um, and I really hope that we get a CLI because that meets uh, the needs of a subset of our users. Um, and in order for us to reach even more users, uh, I think we will need a UI that will allow users to get started uh, much more quickly with Pulp. Um, with um, there are there is a set of users uh, that is already using our competitors' products, uh, such as Artifactory or Nexus, and the really nice thing about all both of those is that you can get started with both of those by going to a web UI putting in a little bit of information and you have your repositories uh, being synced and published and available to your clients. Brian, do you want to add something? Oh, you know me. Um, yes. Yeah, uh, one of the reasons why this session is important is because um, Pulp having a UI is somewhat of a controversial thing. Um, yep. And so we need to make sure that this is the, um, that its motivations are really on solid ground, that they're not just things that are perceived by um, some folks, but not you know actually uh, matching a, an accurate fact-based reality. And also uh, one of the reasons why um, it's an, it's a sort of a line that we that the pulp project has never crossed. Um, we have always been a API based uh, only service. We have shipped a CLI, but um, we have always said when asked, when will pulp have a UI? The answer is pulp will not have a UI. It will always allow other projects to build a UI on top of it. Um, but well, the, our answer has been that Catello is our UI. Catello is our UI. Yeah, that has been the answer. Um, now there's another UI. Galaxy NG is also a UI. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right about that, Dennis. Um, the biggest on. challenge with that answer, though, is that um, it, even though Catello is a UI, it's in order to deploy that UI, you have to bring so some other technologies uh, along with it. And it just complicates uh, that deployment. And it comes with its own set of workflows um, and its own um, RBAC system. And it, it does not provide Pulp users enough flexibility to do things that they want to do with Pulp. And so a UI that's specifically designed for Pulp 
and exposing its uh, flexibility the will allow more users to experience pulp in the way that pulp was designed to be experienced. Yep. And I think that the, that um, what you're saying, Dennis, speaks to the heart of the challenge, which is that what we what I, what I don't think we want to do is go through a great deal of effort to produce a UI that receives the same uh, critiques that the existing UIs do, which um, just to sum all of them up into one simple statement, the UI is not restrictive or does not match my workflow. Um, and this is uh, this is why people don't want to use the existing UIs in many cases. And so, you know, if there is a, the biggest risk uh, around this, um, is that we'll we'll end up with something that the same can be true said true of that of this new UI. So, but I do believe that there is a way to get that right. And what Dennis said, I think, gets to the heart of the matter, which is that this would be a UI that centers around the pulp feature set, whereas the others don't. They center around a specific workflow that that UI wants users to do, um, and that's great for their users. I don't, I don't even feel negatively about that. I hope that's not perceived as negative, um, but that's the that's the distinction between the two efforts. And I know that creating a successful UI is important, but also that it can be done uh, and done well because Artifactory and Nexus both seem to have done that. Um, I haven't gone and played with their UIs because partly partly because I'm not I don't I want to remain unbi unbiased in terms of what that would be. I don't think we should just rush out and make something just like that. I don't think that would be. Um, I, I don't believe that's the best way to identify the look, feel, and workflows of our, our UI. I think working with our user community, like we always do, is the best path to identifying a UI that's valuable to them. I got just a question because I see in the list that we are counting like the CLI or the UI. And what about to join it? That's what the CLI, which we want, uh, the UI can. That can be even easier to like thinking about the UI because we will have some base for it. Yeah, I think we definitely want both. Um, absolutely. And <clears throat> I think uh, that the UI will be able to probably do even more than the CLI can. Um, and not necessarily more, the same thing, but in an easier way. Uh, the, one of the things we, in our last session, we discussed with regard to the CLI is that uh, it may be really cumbersome and difficult to specify a specific RPM that you want to add to a repository. Well, with a UI, you can present a user with, you know, a table of RPMs and they can check a box or they can drag that uh, RPM and add it to a repository um, without having to think about how to identify it. And the JavaScript on the page will know all the information about how to add that specific package to a repository. Um, and so some interactions will uh, be easier in a GUI. Um. I agree with all that. Uh, also, <clears throat> Pavel, in terms of the idea, um, I like the question. In terms of the idea, um, how do these things work together? We, we absolutely do want both. I think just to reiterate that what Dennis had said, but I do believe that there is a unique opportunity to have the UI show you a CLI command that you can run. Um, like for instance, when you're browsing on this particular repository and you want to upload something to it, um, it knows the type of repository that it is, so it can know the client command that it can run, whether it's the pulp CLI or whether it's, you know, in the case of like, for instance, Ansible, um, there's the Ansible CLI because it has a formal CLI or um, other clients that have their own actual shipped 
CLI that pairs with that content type. And usually pulp contains integrations that work with those CLIs. And so um, I, I think that's important because if you have a UI and you've created a repository, um, say you want to pair with your CI CD system, what you need is uh, an easy way to have a copy paste command that you can put into your CI CD script. And boom, that's how your CI CD is now publishing into this thing that you can then come back and look at in the UI. And it's like, oh, look, I have all these new versions, new, new content from the CI yeah. CD. Yeah. yeah the, sorry. <laughs> the direction of my question was about to reuse CLI if it will be first that we can already use it and vice versa. So I pretty like this idea, thanks. Yeah, and especially in comparison to something like, not to point any names, but OpenShift console where, you know, doing something in there it, and trying to, you know, figure out the CLI to do that becomes a pretty obtuse reverse engineering effort. Uh, and that seems kind of <laughs> unfortunate. Yeah, it would be nice to avoid that. Yep. Um, one of the things I wanted to call out is the relative priority between the CLI and the UI. This is um, a topic that has come up at a couple different points. And uh, the CLI is absolutely the priority. Um, the UI will be a much larger, much longer effort. Um, it's going to be a many months to, I mean, it's, it's going to take a life of its own, I'm sure. Um, so the CLI, on the other hand, as you saw from our last session, um, if you saw it, has a has a great demo. It's come a long way for Pulp File. It's I would say in the middle the middle game. Um, it's more than just a design. It's it's code implemented, and now it comes down to extending it, the CLI that is, and um, broadening its command set, bringing all the content types into support, getting the CI running for it. So there's a lot to do, but it's it's absolutely going to be the priority um, ahead of the UI. And part of that, um, because the UI, I think, falls into, for the Pulp project, falls into the high reward but long-term interest. It's not like, a, we got to get this done immediately. Um, because it falls into kind of that quadrant of planning, um, it's the kind of thing that uh, I think motivates our strategy. And this is one of the things I wanted to talk about is um, we have a collaboration project with um, UMass, which I believe is University of Massachusetts, if I'm saying that correctly. That's right, at um, Lowell. At Lowell, um, which uh, where some pulp folks, Dennis and David, and I'm gonna hand this over to y'all for a second, um, will be collaborating with a student team, which will be um, putting together kind of the first pass. I won't even call it a prototype. It should be functional for what it does, only it has a very limited feature set. So very limited scope, um, first uh, start of a UI. And uh, you guys want to speak some about the, give an update on that, maybe share the timeline and perhaps highlight the outline. Um, sure, yeah. Um, the project uh, is going to be worked on by a group of students. Uh, they have a class, this is like a capstone project for these computer science students. And they will be completing the work over a course of two semesters. Um, and what we've asked them to implement is a set of uh, interfaces that will allow users to work with the file plugin. And we're hoping that um, they'll be able to move on to the RPM content type, but uh, we really wanted to start with something simple like we did when the, we were developing with Pulp 3. And we want the user as a result uh, at the end of this project to be able to um, monitor tasks. That's the first thing we're gonna, uh, we're asking them to focus on because uh, Pulp is such an asynchronous system. Um, we wanted a good UI that, a component that's reusable throughout uh, the UI for monitoring the tasks that are going on. Um, because whenever we do any sort of updates, 
uh, to repositories, uh, remotes, all of that stuff is uh, uh, asynchronous and not just the act the sync and publish tasks. Um, so users will be able to create repositories, list them, update them. Um, and when a UI user will uh, be creating a repository, they will be able to specify right away that they want this repository to sync from a particular URL. And they will be able to say that they want this uh, repository distributed a particular relative path in the content app um and we're being very you know prescriptive with that workflow um but i believe that's uh, going to make it uh the most uh useful for someone who wants to try out pulp is they want to be able to sync and publish a repository right away um and so then once they create a repository, they'll be able to sync it. And then they'll be able to take a look and see what content is present in the repository version that was created. Um, and so we're, I'm hoping that uh, by the end of, you know, their semester, somewhere around April, uh, after the, in the, at the end of the spring semester, we'll be able to, uh, demonstrate that actually the students will be uh, doing a demonstration of this project. Um, David, do you want to add anything? I think you covered it all. Cool. And so... And these two semesters, it's the fall semester that's roughly happening now, and then the right. spring semester. Yeah, yeah it's going to, I think it's going to take a, a little while for them to wrap, wrap uh, ramp up. So it might take a couple more months. That's right. And as I understand it, uh, so you guys will be ment mentoring them. Um, uh, but also, so I believe the strategy. Be <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, one, one talk about the, the things, strategy. Yeah, the strategy is to introduce them to open source development and uh, have uh, them clearly communicate on our mailing lists, um, what they're doing and uh, the progress that they're making and soliciting, uh, you know, uh, advice, uh, feedback, um, and doing this on our mailing list, but also in our IRC channels, maybe the matrix channel soon. Um, <laughs> and uh, have them be part of our community and uh, reach out to anyone, you know, on the team, not necessarily anybody uh, in particular, but just uh, feel comfortable to be an open source contributor that is working on the pulp project. Um, I think we do a good job of collaborating with folks that do want to contribute. And I hope that um, we can work with these students just like with any other contributors. And obviously David and I will uh, have, you know, uh, designated times when we do meet with them to make sure that, um, you know, whatever specific uh, needs that they have are being met. But in general, when it comes to um, uh, asking questions about pulp and so that they can reach out to the broader community. Dennis, they're, um... The, uh, their cap presentation at the end of this, that's also going to be like public invite, yes? Anybody from the community could attend when they present I, this? I, I believe so, yeah, because uh, whenever what inspired me to write this proposal was a presentation that I saw from uh, the spring semester that uh, one of the teams did for the Foreman project. Right. And um, it was a great demo, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to share something similar. Yeah. Very cool. What did they work on for the Foreman project? Uh, they uh, created a tool that um, gives better insight into the content views in Foreman. And uh, 
lets users drill down into them more than they can in Catello. And uh, I believe that this uh, was a new tool to keep things uh, simple, um, as in so that they wouldn't have to learn all about Catello in order to uh, do this work. And so this tool that they created connects to the uh, form and server and uses the REST API to create an additional UI. Cool. And so the technologies that we're going to be using there are React and Patternfly, um, which is in line with uh, other, uh, you know, open source projects making uh, UIs these days. And um, I, I see David Newswingers on the call. Um, thank you for joining us, David. Um, Dennis, David Newswinger, or David Davis, do you guys want to talk a little bit about the um, the head start that the Galaxy NG UI has been uh, helping out this effort with? Well, I uh, had a, a chance to talk to David Newswinger, who uh, has put together a UI for Pulp for Galaxy NG. And he shared uh, some important patterns uh, that they developed in uh, designing the UI that has helped uh, keep uh, th uh, the UI consistent with the state of um, the server. And uh, we're definitely going to share the information with the students to make sure that uh, they make use of that pattern. Um, we also learned of some gaps in our REST API um, that would not allow a UI and to interact with it. The main one being that you have to uh, send uh, basic auth credentials with every request right now. And there is no way to uh, use a session token. Um, and so we will be making those improvements uh, very shortly. Um, and um, they, I'm not sure of very many components that can be reused, but uh, I will definitely be looking uh, to David Newswinger to uh, <laughs> give us advice as uh, issues come up with um, just, you know, getting ramped up on JavaScript and the pattern fly and uh, React. Yeah, I apologize. I missed the first half of this meeting. I was stuck in another meeting, but yeah, I'm happy to help however I can. Uh, I just want to take a second since you're on the call. Um, I appreciate that so much, David, and the Pulp community I'm sure does too. Um, if you haven't gotten a chance to try the very excellent uh, Galaxy NG UI that um, the team has uh, built, and uh, I know David Newswinger's um, worked heavily on, along with a bunch of other uh, folks, to try it out. Um, I've seen, uh, I've messed with it a little bit, and I've also seen a, kind of a comprehensive demo of it, and it's just, it's really beautiful, and I think for the workflows that it's trying to accomplish, it does a really great job of doing just that. Um, it's focused on the uh, collection content type. So it's got a very deep focus in that particular area. Um, and uh, that's one of the differentiators around it. Um, it goes really deep on that. Uh, it's purpose built for that content type. Um, whereas this other thing will likely not be able to go as deep, um, certainly, uh, and we'll try to cover, gosh, I mean, like 10, 15, 20 content types. And so it's it's uh, just one of the big differentiators there. But really, David, I, I can't say enough good things um, about what you all have built, because that's how I feel about it. And I also really appreciate the um, collaboration. Uh, without seeing such a great example, I would be a little bit more tentative about the Pulp team uh, and the Pulp community's ability to kind of see this, this through. But I, I really believe it, because I've seen it from you all. Well, thank you. Is there a so, demo, David, 
David or David or Brian, is there a demo or recording somewhere of uh, the Galaxy NG UI? Or can we have David come to one of our team meetings and give us a 15 minute walkthrough? Uh, there are, I don't think we've done a comprehensive demo of everything, um, but I, I did a demo for some of our new features around content sync and repositories yesterday uh, that I can provide a link to. Uh, uh, that'd be great, thank you. Um, also, uh, and that would be great, David. Also, um, Melanie, myself, and David New Swinger, I believe you've seen a copy of it, and a few other folks too. Um, we're working on, or really, Melanie is leading a um, article on somewhere, probably opensource.com, maybe elsewhere, uh, which is designed to um, spread the word and information about the Gallup CNG plugin. And of course, the UI is, is one of the central focuses of that article. So these kinds of demos and um, are exactly what we'll need to have recorded along with some key screenshots to um, tell that story accurately. Um, so more demos will be will be needed, David, is kind of what I'm what I'm trying to get out here. Yeah, I'm happy happy to show it off whenever you want. Cool. Um, other questions? Yes, please. Um, yeah, I, I would like to talk a bit about the motivations. Um, I, I do agree that uh, Pulp will benefit from the UI and then no account am I trying to say otherwise or convince otherwise. However, I would like to step back and specifically process the feedback from the survey. Um, if I'm not mistaken, then it might be possible. Um, um, Melanie was mentioning that actually the from the user's feedback, they're not that interested in UI. That's our current users. Mm -hmm. that, that's accurate. You know, that's, it, it, that's absolutely accurate. My concern is that I, I wouldn't like us to invest a lot of uh, time and resources into something which will basically not be popular or requested by the users. Yeah, and so my biggest motivation is to be able to capture more users that don't necessarily feel comfortable um, working with uh, just a CLI or just the REST API. But for attracting more users, you have to make the current users happy. Yeah. Um, I guess that's a parallel goals. And uh, I also think that with our community survey, we reach only a certain subset of people. Um, it was definitely like uh, expressed so many times at multiple conferences and people was reaching out asking for UI like hundreds of times. So it feels like um, with different uh, ways of communication, we're reaching different groups of users. So uh, I would be very cautious to 100% rely on community survey on this topic. I, I'd also add something about the survey. Um, I doubt I'm the only pedant that filled out the survey and it's worded in such a way as lacking a UI, would that stop you from using pulp or stop you from migrating? And no, it wouldn't. So I had to say no to the question. But that does not mean that I do not want or would not appreciate a UI. Um, the, the survey is written in such a way that it, it doesn't highlight the difference between needing and desiring. I don't need it. The, the core element of how we will interact with it will be via the REST API, but most definitely it would be beneficial to have one. Um, and I can think of umpteen reasons for that. Awesome. Yeah, and um, I mean, I have my own personal take on it, um, but what I want to really focus on right now with my words is that um, there is a balance that we must keep in mind between 
not losing sight of our current value proposition and our road to improvement and our road to continue to serve our existing user base and balance that against the, um, the goals of growing the user base and um, bringing in different types of users. And um, so this is something I wanna keep thinking in mind and I don't wanna become too focused on either one of these goals. And if one of them begins to put the other one significantly at risk, we need to really be cognizant about, you know, what are we doing here in terms of creating value for the public community as a whole? Um, so uh, what I think that means, like that all sounds great and everything, but what does that mean in practice? I think it means that uh, the UI will be something that is developed slowly and over a long period of time. And we will try to pair our level of effort and investment in it along with the value that we see it creating in the community. And like most parts of our software, it creates an initial, it requires an initial investment on our part. And I see that this um, UMass Lowell project as the kind of current level of investment spend, at least through April, for example. Um, meanwhile, other projects like the CLI or aspects of the project like the CLI will continue to go on as a as a definitely going to deliver. Um, let's make real progress on it. Well said. Yep. Um, we, uh, we have a little bit of time left. Um, there are some discussion questions on the, uh, on the agenda. This is really a time for us to just have open discussion. So, you know, uh, I, I didn't write these points on here. So, um, would anyone feel, uh, like they would like to share a perspective uh, or a concern or some other discussion point related to perhaps what I see around, around lines 30 through 33. I stopped sharing my screen, but I hope you guys have the agenda. I think it's 30, or is this on the uh, motivation and perceptions for a QE for Paul document that you talk about? Uh, yeah, and I just put a link to this uh, in the chat as well again. Yeah, I think those are my uh, my comments. Uh, well, except for the blue jeans. I'm not sure where that came from. But, uh, oh, that's a demo. Uh, I mean, part of it to me is with pulp, there's so many resource types and you know, the, the relations aren't necessarily obvious uh, so sometimes having you know we have open api schema and viewers and you know i, I have a django admin that has a lot of the stuff and i can you know jump sql schema etc cetera, etc cetera, but actually seeing like the stuff like with real content filled in uh in a in a kind of easier way to um like if I was looking at a pulp UE and it actually had, you know, RPMs and Ansible collections and containers and files and all of those things, and I could poke through those and see what information is available and how, you know, how RPMs get organized into repositories and how collections get, you know, see that kind of stuff. To me, that would be save, you know, hours and hours of um, brain work <laughs> to yeah uh, and what what I'm hearing is that even though the rest API is great and like it's very powerful um, you could be uh, introduced to that rest API through a UI by having a visual representation of how things relate to each other and uh, what belongs where and then 
you could take that system and make more use of it through the REST API once you have that understanding. Yeah, especially if it's real data for real things in there. Yeah. Or, um... You know, we've talked about several times over the course of this week, the goal of how can we make easy things easy and still make the difficult, complicated things possible uh, in, in a, in a, uh, for, for the user pulp? And there's, there's often a uh, fairly common flow of a new user. The UI is there, and they can, they can see all these things that Adrian is talking about. And they're like, oh, OK, I think I grok that now. The CLI lets them work on those things at a, at a workflow level. And then when, when their CI people come in or their really complicated development people come in and go, we need to do this really complicated thing, they can say, well, I've got this list of REST APIs that we can plug into our existing tooling. Um, and so that, that flow is a very typical one of someone going from the Neophyte user to the power user. And it feels like what I've seen this week from everyone involved in these efforts is that we're supporting that flow. Right? There's nothing that the UI is going to be able to do, for example, that the REST API doesn't have because the UI goes through the same REST API that everybody else does. And I'm, so I'm actually excited about this whole process over the course of the next year because I think we're, we're going to learn things from the, the, the community that we have and as we grow the community um, in ways that will make the back end better while giving more functionality to people to get them up to speed faster. So I'm, I'm two thumbs way up on both the CLI and the UI. Um, I really like what, what I've heard this week. Yeah, and your, your comment about the improving the backend API, some of the stuff in Galaxy and G is probably uh, an example of, you know, sometimes there's, you know, there's just spots where there's we want to get data in a way that's not really practical and the kind of the straightforward um, API, you know, it's this weird cross cutting and you know whatever else just for presenting it as a UE. Because you know, UE is never reflect same <laughs> human centric UEs never reflect same data. Uh, structures and organization, right? It's always that weird thing you have to do in the middle to make it. Uh, so just some of that, and some of that could get probably extended into some of the uh, core uh, API endpoints. There's not a ton of stuff, but there's a few things. Uh, but that's just an exact. Uh, Existing example of the kind of thing you were mentioning. So um, we're at 1041. Um, I would like to us to consider adjourning a little bit early and also perhaps starting our next session a little bit early. Um, our next session has, we've had a little bit of a, an agenda change. Um, it was going to just be the closing ceremonies and now it will be the, uh, a few miscellaneous topics. We have at least two identified, which is Ubuntu support and the installer and then caching uh, related to the downtime discussions. Um, and also uh, if there is still time, uh, maybe sharing some perspectives around releasing Y releases with or without a delay for manual testing. Um, and then after that, we will adjourn with the closing ceremonies brought to you by Rebecca Black and Friday. And uh, so to do all that, I, I would like to hear if people are comfortable closing this now and then resuming at maybe uh, 1050 Eastern time or that's about our normal break time. Any final comments before we end this video? No, I said we cut it early so we have extra time for the airing of grievances. Yes, the airing <laughs> of grievances. That's Perfect. a traditional among our people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Um, thanks a bunch, uh, everybody who joined the session and sharing the different perspectives on it, and uh, Dennis for, for running it. Very cool. See you all at 10.
Okay. See you all soon. Stop the record. Yeah, I'll stop it now. <laughs>